name is Jillian and I'm a third year student here at Charlotte School of Law. I have the great honor of introducing you today to Professor Wayne McKay. Professor McKay is a nationally recognized teacher and scholar, an accomplished author in the areas of constitutional law, the charter, human rights, privacy law, and education law. He has received numerous awards and prizes and is known for his ongoing dedication and contributions to service and the community. I don't want to embarrass him by reciting all of his accomplishments, so I will just give you a few highlights. He is the founding director of the Indigenous Black and Mi'kmaq Initiative and has served as the director of the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission. For three years, he was president and vice chancellor of Mount Allison University. And in 2005, he was invested as a member of the Order of Canada by Mikhail Jean in recognition of his commitment and passion to human rights, equality, and diversity in Canada. He is the current Yogis and Kenny Chair in Human Rights Law. And just this year, he was voted one of the Canadian Lawyer Magazine's top 25 most influential lawyers for his work on cyberbullying. That work began in 2011 when he was the chair of the Nova Scotia Task Force on Bullying and Cyberbullying. And even though the task force has wrapped up and recommendations have been made, he has continued to speak on the issue and becoming a leading advocate for respectful and responsible relationships in the process. To me, he is my teacher, mentor, and friend. My law school experience has been enriched beyond measure because I have had the opportunity to learn from him. It is a great privilege to introduce Professor Wayne McKay. Thank you very much, Jillian, for the very kind introduction for some of the students who might have had me a long time ago. A number of changes. Well, some things change, some things don't. Well, first of all, we all get older. But uh, also, I suspect in most cases, I never wore a suit presenting. I guess I can't imagine I did, but they told me I probably should for this. Uh, and uh, secondly, I certainly was, and still am, pretty low tech. But I'm going to try to do this in part through a PowerPoint presentation. And there is a kind of handout of the slides. If anybody didn't get those down here at the front, you don't absolutely have to have them. But uh, assuming. I'm almost certainly not going to get through all these. They are there with a bit more information if you want it. So, and thank you for coming. I appreciate that. Lots of other interesting things to do. And I guess heading from here to uh, receptions and dinner and all those kind of things. All right, as Jillian suggested, uh, my current kind of uh, reinvention, I guess, is in relation to issues of cyberbullying and related issues, although I still do the public constitutional admin, the other more traditional stuff, but I made a bit of a joke when we launched the report that maybe I was going to be one of those actors that gets typecast so that the only thing I can do is this thing, and it's kind of turned out that way so far, uh, that mostly the people want to talk to me from the media and everything else about cyberbullying, not about human rights or constitutional law or educational law or anything else. But anyway, that may change over time. Cyberbullying is... Uh, Jillian rightly pointed out, was kind of a, an immersion. It was an immersion uh, in the issues around cyberbullying. So what I've been doing is putting together various presentations and advocating for implementing the recommendations in the report, but more particularly uh, promoting a, a safer and respectful school environment in particular, but others. And what I'm going to try to do today, or at least uh, introduce you to, is kind of a quick panorama of the scope of the issue in general terms and then talk a little bit since obviously it's a law audience about what kind of legal responses that might, might be helpful and hopefully are helpful in responding to problems of bullying and cyberbullying. So here we go. First obvious point but wasn't so obvious to me till I got really immersed in it is that with all the obvious advantages of technology and social media and interconnection that we have there's also, as with most things technological and otherwise, a, a flip side, which is kind of a dark underbelly of social media and technology. And at least one part of that are the problems of bullying and cyberbullying and you know, the whole universe, which is much more connected to young people than certainly to myself, uh, is one that uh, has its significant risks as far as invasions of privacy and threats and cyberbullying and so on. But we'll get into that. The short background, in 2011, uh, the task force, and this is actually a copy of it, and uh, sort of a nice colorful cover and all of that, which is available, Look, I'll give you the website on it at the end, uh, started in 2011, unfortunately arising primarily 
out of some very somewhat lower profile but high profile at the time suicides that were in part linked to cyberbullying and bullying. And in fact, these are not nearly as high profile as Ma Amanda Todd and Retea Parsons and some of the cases I'll talk about in a moment. But there were young women who died as a result of suicide connected in part with bullying and cyberbullying that really were the impetus for starting the task force in the first place. And then uh, we reported uh, in uh, February of uh, 29th of 2012, I tell my students that you know, if you're going to have to do a report, you might as well get at least one extra day in, right? So it's a leap year, right? So, uh, it, and it was, I think, delivered about 11.30 on February uh, 29th, 2012, but on time. Anyway, so that started in 2011, about a close to nine or ten month process, and uh, quite an interesting and, and challenging one. The idea to make practical long and short term recommendations to the Minister of Education about what might be done in respect to bullying and cyberbullying. We did a, a couple of things early on as a way to try to particularly look at the scope of the problem and get some suggestions as to what people think should be done about it. And one was to have an online survey, since uh, we were trying to reach young people or a wide range of audiences and had our own Facebook site and Twitter site and all those things that I don't fully know how to navigate, but some people did. Uh, and as a result, got 5,000 responses, which the Nova Scotia government tells me is the highest response they've ever got to a survey. Uh, and, and that's particularly striking because uh, this was done before I arrived, but the actual survey itself, it took about 30 to 45 minutes to actually fill out, which is quite substantial online. And so the other remarkable part about those 5,000 responses is close to 60% of those were young people which in itself sends a message that they cared enough about the issue of bullying and cyberbullying that they wanted to be heard on that, even though it involved taking a fair bit of time filling out surveys, which nobody much likes to do. The second thing we did, recognizing the important, importance of youth engagement, was to have a series of youth focus groups throughout the province, every school district, uh, and also some targeted focus groups in particular areas, such as Aboriginal, African Nova Scotian, disabled, Gay, uh, gay and lesbian and so on, and got some really useful information out of that. And the website that I'll get uh, put on in the last slide and you can take away with you uh, actually has all of those appendices as well. And there's a very, all of it's interesting, but in particular the ones that's the summary of the youth focus groups is really quite revealing about how they see the problem and what might be done about it. So I, I recommend that. The other issue is though my mandate from the Department of Education was to focus on schools and cyberbullying and bullying in schools, it's not unique to young people and not unique to schools. And one of the interesting, I think somewhat less studied issues at the moment is workplace bullying and cyberbullying. And there's a little bit done on that, but not as much as there could be. And who knows, maybe some of you are victims or perpetrators in your own workplace, I doubt it. But any, any event, that, that is an issue and one that's not as much studied. An international problem, Nova Scotia seems to be kind of the epicenter for cyberbullying because of, well, the task force, the suicides, the Retea Parsons case, and so on, but it's very much an international issue. And shortly after the Retea Parsons case, which probably most of you have heard about, a very similar case uh, in California, where unfortunately, again, uh, tragically, a young woman uh, commits suicide in part because of, again, an alleged sexual assault and uh, cyberbullying with pictures online. So unfortunately, this is not an atypical thing and, and is all too widely known, so, and lots of others in the United States as well and elsewhere. A national problem, uh, actually just about a year ago, I think it was October 10th, uh, a year ago, that Amanda Todd, in a very high profile from BC uh, way, uh, not only took her own life, but did the YouTube, the very uh, sort of gripping and, and sad uh, YouTube where she did the, the cards uh, sort of explaining in part how she felt about things and that uh, she was likely going to end her life. And similar to a lot of these, not all of these, she too had a sexual component to it because part of the cyberbullying was a, a picture of her, a partially nude picture, which was then used to harass her through various schools and so on. And just uh, within the last two weeks, actually, uh, Todd Loyak from uh, North Battleford, Saskatchewan, who 
So it's not always young women, although there seems to be a disproportionate number of young women. Uh, all, uh, just before his uh, 16th birthday, also took his life by suicide, in part, it's always not a directly cause and effect kind of thing, but in part as a result of both bullying and cyberbullying, which usually happen together. It's usually not either or, but if you're bullied, you're likely to also be cyberbullied, and if you're cyberbullied, you're likely to be bullied as well. And then probably now, the, certainly in Nova Scotia and beyond the highest profile one at the local level, although it's gone national and international, the Retea Parsons case, which many of you would know in terms of the alleged sexual assault uh, for young uh, boys, classmates uh, from Cold Harbor High, and two of them now being charged with child pornography, and I'll get into some of that. But I guess as part of the difficult and dark underbelly of social media and technology, many of you might have noticed that uh, as a kind of added injury that uh, some uh, dating website, I think, uh, or out of Germany, was trolling for pictures of teenage women in, uh, in Canada, and I guess maybe went with the most uh, hits on a particular image, and it was Retea Parsons, and presumably, on a best case scenario, without doing any research to know how inappropriate that was, put her uh, picture on the site for some time until they took it down or a more sinister view is they knew full well what they were doing and thought they'd get a lot of attention, whichever. Uh, just another sort of sad element to that. So the Retea Parsons case occurred almost exactly a year after the release of the task force report, and a lot of things, to be fair to our beleaguered government at the moment, they did a lot of things, not all of the recommendations, there were 85 of the task force report, and. Uh, there's still some things to be done, but they did some of that. But a lot more has happened, not surprisingly perhaps, but somewhat tragically, after the Retea Parsons case, including things we'll touch on like the Cyber Safety Act and so on. So things did happen before that, in the year before. A couple of things that didn't happen, and there's never a cause and effect, but makes you pause. One of the recommendations in the, my task force report was a clarification that school authorities have jurisdiction over this, even if it's after hours and off premises, so long as there's a negative impact on the school climate. And that was not the interpretation of the school authorities in the Retea Parsons case. And in fact, they didn't engage in any discipline structure, which was one of the things that she felt was uh, part of the negativity about all this, that not, not only were they not taking her seriously, they didn't even really investigate it. And they gave two reasons both of which I think were actually wrong. One, that they didn't have the jurisdiction, because I think they do anyway, and they certainly do now, because uh, after Retea Parsons, the Act has been amended to say that, as it already does in Ontario. And secondly, that because there was an ongoing criminal investigation, they wouldn't want to have a discipline process because it might interfere with the criminal process. But as most of you would know, it's not at all uncommon to have parallel processes, a discipline process, maybe a civil suit, a criminal, that wouldn't necessarily be a problem. Anyway, they didn't do that. And other things such as, which have now been acted on as well, to hire more guidance counselors so there would be more human beings on site for people that are struggling with issues of mental health and cyberbullying and so on, that they might be able to prevent these kind of things. So you never know, but uh, there are things that perhaps could have been done. The police investigation was reopened. And as again, many of you know, although you may not all be from around here, that uh, the decision, even after being reopened, was not to, make any, to lay any charges in respect to the alleged sexual assault, but to lay charges in relation to two of the boys in relation to child pornography. And one of the kind of depressing, actually, and scary things about all of this in looking at cyberbullying is uh, seeing how cruel people can be. And, to some extent, where, where the value systems are, and maybe I'm just old-fashioned, but I don't think that's it. It seems to me not particularly funny or a good idea to be taking pictures off a young woman who, at a minimum, is having sex or more likely was being possibly being actually sexually assaulted and sending that online to everybody in sight. Same thing with the Amanda Todd case. So you kind of have to pause and uh, worry, I guess, about our value system that that seemed to, be, uh, de seemed to be appropriate or fun or a good idea. And anyway, a little bit like the St. Mary's chant as well, things like that. So 
So a lot of attention to that and a lot of things have happened, including some uh, studies, the justice uh, review of that still happening, the education one did, and there's going to be one, or is one in progress for the IWK as well. Uh, the Herald cartoonist Bruce McKinnon always does a, a great job of capturing the essence of these things, and he did a cartoon about the fact that maybe uh, had there been a bit more attention to some of the uh, recommendations, maybe these things, as again, never know for sure, might not have happened. And in fairness, a lot has happened since the Parsons case, although it would have been nice to happen before it, uh, such tragedies occur. So where to from here? Well, they had the, the various uh, the reviews, including the one on schools by Milton and Pepler, Nova Scotia's Cyber Safety Act, uh, very interesting. I'll say a bit more about that if we get there a bit later, but Nova Scotia now is the leader, for better or for worse, as far as sanctions for, for cyberbullying. It is by far and away the most comprehensive and uh, sanction-focused approach to uh, cyberbullying in the country, including a cyber scan unit with six designated uh, investigators and so on. So, but that's clearly one of the things that came out of it, the child pornography charges. Interesting to sort of pause in our lawyer hat on those kind of things that there's a number of possible sections in the criminal code that might apply to this kind of thing, but whether child pornography is the most appropriate one to capture this, not quite so clear. I mean, there's criminal uh, harassment, uh, intimidation, uh, all kinds of other possible provisions in the existing criminal code, and our current Justice Minister, Peter McKay, is apparently proceeding with some changes and we'll talk later about whether there should be a, an offense under the criminal code of cyberbullying, but even short of that, there's other things. Uh, again, just very recently out of Victoria, the other part of the, the other coast of the country, another similar case charged with child pornography, bit of a different twist here. The person being charged is a young woman who's uh, texting and uh, putting online uh, naked pictures of her boyfriend's ex-girlfriend. There's probably some kind of a story there, but anyway, the the story is not a good one in terms of the impact on the victim or the impact on her as she now faces uh, child pornography charges. And I think there's one other, apart from the Retea Parsons ones in Nova Scotia, where a 14-year-old has been charged as well with child pornography, a case of at least apparently consensual sex, but the uh, pictures or video of that, which uh, the other person didn't even know was happening, put on, uh, on YouTube and so on. Who should respond? Massive community problem. The kind of obvious point, everybody needs to respond, or just about everybody in different ways. Parents have important roles to play. Teachers, school administrators, counselors, it can go on down the list. And including internet service providers, there's an important role for everybody to play. And in the task force, we had a fairly extensive working group that did have representatives from most of those kind of groups, including Bell Alliant and Eastlink and Rogers and those kind of people, and Facebook and others. So it's an interesting kind of legal question, who should be doing things about this and what should they be doing? So, How do we respond? Lots of uh, different possibilities. Uh, the obviously whole school interagency co cooperation, which is always uh, a target or a desire, but very difficult to do. Uh, as many of you may know from even your jobs, there are bureaucratic tendencies that exist about silos operating within silos, and though everybody talks about cooperation between departments, it's very difficult to do. Uh, progressive discipline, youth engagement, restorative approaches, I'll touch some more on those uh, later. And my focus has been mostly on schools, but as I say, it's larger than that. Legal responses, so criminal code, obviously one possibility, but as I'm sure you all would agree, the criminal code is the ultimate sanction, and in that sense, the kind of last resort. And we should always be cautious, I would think, in adding new provisions and new sections to the criminal code. So whether or not we actually need a criminal code offense of cyberbullying or bullying is not so clear. I think there's a possibility for a number of existing sections to be creatively applied. So that's, uh, whether we need that, a, a different story. But that's only one option. I'll come back to that. Lawsuits, negligence, and defamation. A lot of uh, defamation cases, and we'll come to that in a, deep, in a moment as well, with high damages online. And negligence increasingly in various places, Australia and to some extent in Canada now, school boards and others are being sued for negligence, not just in 
the cases where they've uh, not done anything, but cases where they haven't done enough, that it needs to be preventive. And then, of course, constitutional limits, human rights, and restorative justice. So criminal code, number of provisions, as I've said, those are just a few that uh, might be applied in the existing criminal code. And I think a lot of parents and others, certainly Retea Parsons' parents and others, have been somewhat frustrated by the fact that no charges were laid under the criminal code. And it seemed uh, that on some analysis, you could say, you could think of a number of things that could be uh, laid. And in the end, they did go with child pornography. But we recommended, since it's, uh, our jurisdiction didn't extend federally, that the Nova Scotia Minister of Justice confer with his colleagues about whether or not they did need to make changes to the criminal code, which after Retea Parsons, they did do, and that uh, Premier Dexter as well went to Ottawa with various suggestions. One of them, which is an interesting idea that may emerge in uh, new changes, a new law dealing with uh, the, on, the uh, distribution of intimate images without consent. And that's proposed not just in relation to young people, so broader than child pornography, that would make it an offense to so-called revenge porn and those kinds of things, that with the significant invasions of privacy and those kind of things, that maybe we need a law that deals with that, which doesn't exist at the moment. You could try to make arguments about invasion of privacy, but that's not an easy process. So the, the, one of the things they are exploring is whether they're going to add that as well. It's always good to have the prime minister in your slides, right? So. Uh, and the Prime Minister on this one uh, was certainly immediately after Retea Parsons on side, saying, I think we've got to stop using just the term bullying to describe these things. It has a connotation of kind of misbehaving. And that's a really important point, one that we looked at in the report. Language is always significant. And part of the significance here is, is bullying too soft a term for the kinds of things that are happening? Should we be talking about assaults? Should we be talking about intimidation? Should we be talking about harassment? And should we be using more the language of law and sanctions, or whatever, stronger language, than sort of morality or the kind of bullying, which is like boys will be boys, or you know everybody goes through this and we've all been bullied, yeah, sort of uh, suck it up and move on, or whatever. And with the, the advance of technology and the social media and the internet, the impact is much greater. So anyway, that, that uh, comment was made after that. A number of possible amendments, and there's a federal provincial report on what they might look at on that, the distribution of intimate images, as I mentioned earlier, and with some pretty significant proposed sentences. And as with any problem that you try to respond to in law, there's a question of what you do and then what kind of a sanction if you find somebody is guilty. So Peter McKay is the Justice Minister. And the task force recommendations on definition, a couple of the definition is quite important. And the, all of this is in the slides, so unfortunately there's no test later. Uh, the definition, a couple of points. First of all, uh, we decided early on in the task force that while there are significant differences, cyberbullying is really a subset of bullying. And that's partly a kind of Canadian-American difference. In the United States, they tend to treat cyberbullying as kind of a separate category from bullying. But we followed more the Canadian and British model, which is to say, Cyberbullying is really just bullying by social media and technology. It's still essentially the same concept, so we define both. And I guess one of the fairly broadly defined, which is good and bad, you have to define it broadly so you don't leave too many gaps, but by de broadly defining it, then you start raising constitutional limits and overbreadth and all those kinds of issues. But one of the things that's relatively, or at least was, and I think still is, unique to the definition here, which has been adopted in the Education Act, is that participating or encouraging bystanders are also liable as cyber bullies under the relevant uh, education discipline structure. So we didn't go so far as the kind of Good Samaritan rule, although bystanders are critical to cyber bullying, that in a lot of the studies say they are the critical players as to how negative the impact is. But uh, so we took that encouraging or participating in some way bystanders should also be liable and accountable for their actions, like the horrendous cases where YouTube videos are taking off uh, boys raping a young girl and people are standing around cheering and, or fights and those kind of things. So the bystander is quite critical. Slightly different, but not very different definition in the Cyber Safety Act, 
which is kind of quasi-criminal provincial legislation, and I'll come to that in a moment, lots of interesting potential lawyer work that will probably play out over the next while under the Cyber Safety Act. But one of the things uh, that it does is it deals only with cyberbullying, which is kind of interesting, a little bit of a different tact from ours where we say bullying and cyberbullying are together and one's a variation of the other. The Cyber Safety Act with very significant sanctions and penalties and so on only deals with cyberbullying, does not deal with bullying, which is fine. Cyber Safety Act, as I said, what the most far-reaching response legally in the country to problems of bullying and cyberbullying. And the first is that it, it does establish a tort of cyberbullying, particularly in respect to parents. And this is quite large if you think about that. It makes it clear under the Cyber Safety Act that you can sue not just the child or whoever it is that's doing the bullying, cyberbullying, but the parent if they fail to reasonably supervise the online activities of their children, which of course is a, quite a, a quagmire of issues in terms of you know, what is reasonable supervision, uh, the gap both on technology and social media between children and their parents and adults generally is so large, you know, what, how can you do it if you can't, don't even understand the, the technology? And, as a kind of an example of how quickly it moves and sort of outdated ideas. When I was on the task force and chairing it, people would come up in grocery stores and gyms and elsewhere sort of talking about it. And one of the things that I was, well, it's one of the things you clearly should do is take the computer and put it in the living room. Don't have it in the bedroom. Well, it's fine, except that the problem is computers now are tiny little things that you put in your pocket or whatever. That's just a one step and uh, maybe a few, uh, years ago that would be quite helpful. Now it's kind of irrelevant because virtually everybody has iPhones and uh, iPads and so on that are much more mobile and that uh, mostly young people have way more knowledge about it and in terms of reasonable supervision what are you supposed to do? You seize the uh, cell phone or the uh, iPhone at the end of class each day and check it. Well if they're at all intelligent, they've eliminated anything that might be problematic knowing you're going to do that. So anyway, what, what is the sort of due diligence is up there, but it, the Cyber Safety Act creates the tort, and they're jointly and severally liable, but it also creates a statutory offense that if a parent does not adequately supervise the online activities of their parents, they are also liable for cyberbullying under the Cyber Safety Act with some pretty serious penalties. So somewhat as a kind of cart before the horse kind of situation. After that, the Department of Education has now circulated uh, pamphlets and information to parents about cyberbullying and those kind of things, but certainly not any kind of a checklist of what is reasonable supervision of your children on those kind of issues. Cyber uh, protection orders, sort of like uh, uh, restraining orders in a domestic violence kind of context, very broad powers that a victim can get protection orders if they're a victim of cyberbullying with extensive powers under that. Cyberbullying prevention orders, and some of this of course has raised all kinds of civil liberties and uh, constitutional kind of questions because it's broad powers to search, to seize computers, to seize iPhones, to uh, get restraining orders that uh, forbid them from using technology, all kinds of very broad powers in relation to the prevention orders under the Cyber Safety Act, which I think uh, probably, uh, certainly the protection orders and probably both of them, I think, are administered by Justice of the Peace under the Cyber Safety Act. Cyber Scan Investigation Unit, pretty significant financial commitment to that. Uh, a head investigator and I think five or six investigators whose job it is to report any any cases of cyberbullying. And cyberbullying under the Cyber Safety Act is not restricted. It's restricted to cyberbullying, but it's not restricted to schools or young people. That could be any cyberbullying as far as I read it. So adult in the workplace, anywhere else. So potentially could be a quite a busy unit. And all of this is quite new. The uh, cyber scan unit has just been put together as of September. So that's again, new and interesting area. Uh, liability for cyberbullying under the Nova Scotia structure has bystanders, as I mentioned earlier, participating and encouraging parent uh, of the defendant and potentially principals or schools, that they're more under a negligence, but the Education Act requires now that principals investigate and that their power of investigation extends off premises and after hours if 
there's a negative impact back on the schools, but you can imagine teachers and principals are concerned about that too. So a lot of new liabilities. Potential constitutional challenges, uh, a number of them. So uh, first of all, in terms of kind of charter issues, obviously free speech questions. Lots of questions about, you know, is anonymity part of free speech or in any event, where do you draw the line between free speech and reasonable limits like hate speech and, you know, pornographic speech and all these kind of things. So now cyberbullying has to be looked at in those con uh, terms. Privacy, lots of privacy issues both for victims and for cyberbullies and all of this. Search and seizure, lots of issues there. Fair process and even the good old division of powers because if the Cyber Safety Act is looked at in its totality, you could make a, a reasonable kind of argument that maybe it's really criminal law in disguise, that it's really 9127 criminal jurisdiction, although we call it preventive and quasi-criminal as opposed to the criminal code, but when you start seizing computers and sending people to uh, incarceration and so on, it starts to sound a little criminal. So anyway, lots, lots of work for the lawyers on that one in the next while. So. The, the role of schools on negligence, I guess it's the next one. This is a pretty hot uh, area at the moment, not a lot of actual cases, but some, saying again, as I mentioned earlier, not just that you have to respond after the fact, but that given the tort requirement to take steps to, present, to prevent foreseeable risks, prevention. Because it's pretty clear, and we're getting more information all the time, that on just about any school setting, there is going to be bullying and cyberbullying. So it's unlikely that you're the one school in Canada that has none of it. So what are you doing at, to proactively prevent that kind of activity? And uh, a lot of those uh, duties are there and uh, being explored. Defamation. And uh, defamation, the last little note uh, for any of you, maybe some of you work in that area, the courts increasingly are recognizing that because of the reach and impact off the internet and social media, damage awards in defamation cases can be quite high. Uh, the one there, I think, was parents that were defaming teachers and principals, and I believe the Newman and Halstead case from 2004, I think the award in that case was something like $550,000 damages. So the courts are recognizing, rightly, I think, that the damage to reputation online is much bigger than if somebody says something in a meeting or they put it in the local paper which has somewhat of a limited circulation, but once it's online, it's online forever and the impact is quite negative. So that's a, an interesting area. A very interesting Supreme Court of Canada case in 2012, a Justice Abella in the Bragg case uh, out of Nova Scotia, an interesting one where a, it was actually a fake Facebook site defaming an, uh, this uh, young woman in, in uh, school. She wanted to take a defamation action through her parents, but did not want to be named, wanted to be anonymous. And the open court principle would normally say, you can't take a defamation action unless you're willing to say, here I am and here's what happened. And uh, so it went all the way to, well, first of all, the two levels of court, Nova Scotia trial and appeal said, no, you, if you're going to take defamation, you have to give up your identity and pursue it under a name, not under a pseudonym or a, a, in, in an anonymous fashion. But the Supreme Court of Canada disagreed with that and in a unanimous decision where Justice Abella wrote said that it was an appropriate exception to the uh, rule of the open court. The girl's privacy interests in the case are tied both to her age and to the nature of victim victimization she seeks protection from. It's not merely a question of her privacy but of her privacy from relentless intrusive humiliation of sexualized bullying. Now this raises one of those nice lawyer interpretation questions, how big is the exception? It's clear, clear when you look at that, it may have a lot of exceptions, uh, there are a lot of limits. The, the age is important. This is, uh, I think, under the age of 17. It was sexualized cyberbullying, which has another component, and that, that citing extensively, actually, from the task force report, which is kind of nice, uh, they said, clearly, we can more or less take judicial notice that cyberbullying is a large negative thing and therefore to properly protect young people who then can have access to the courts for defamation, we should allow an anonymous lawsuit, which they did. So whether they actually proceeded on that, I don't know, but the preliminary issue on that went to the Supreme Court. One of the 
key uh, players in that case was the Kids Help Phone, which was an intervener in the Bragg case. And uh, they put forward a very strong brief, which a lot of the court adopted, saying you need to do this to properly protect young people, particularly young people from sexualized uh, bullying and cyberbullying. And again, that's uh, the, the comment from uh, Justice Abella, which again sort of makes the point of an important exception, not saying that it would necessarily apply if you were an adult. I mean, all the usual questions. What if you were an adult? What if it's not sexualized bullying, but something else? Uh, they, the, all of those are still open. Division of powers. In addition to the federal provincial point I mentioned earlier about possible invasion of 9127 criminal jurisdiction, a number of uh, municipalities in some parts of Canada, mostly in the West, have passed anti-bullying and anti-cyberbullying bylaws, which again raises interesting, it's sort of like the anti-prostitution bylaws in Westendorf way back when and all those kind of things. Is that really within delegated provincial uh, municipal jurisdiction or is that potentially invading criminal law jurisdiction? But those, those do exist. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, lots of charter challenges under 7, 8, or uh, actually it should be 2B. Free speech is 2B. I'm not sure what 2E is, but 2B is free speech. Freedom of expression, uh, lots of important uh, questions there. Privacy considerations. So a little quote, if you can't read, show and tell is not an invasion of privacy, which I think actually that's probably right, because as you probably know, if you can, you can have as much privacy invasion if you like if you consent. So I suppose you might say it's forced. If uh, school is an enforced show and tell, maybe it is an invasion of privacy, but I would think not. In any event, the key case on that, again, a Nova Scotia case, a lot of uh, Nova Scotia cases on this one, the MR versus R MRM case, talking about search in schools and saying there is a reasonable expectation of privacy in schools for our students, a reduced one from the general public, but one nonetheless, which also has to be respected. So there's privacy considerations. Privacy itself, and one of my newer areas I've been teaching a bit in is privacy, is a, a contested area and a very big area right now because of technology and social media. In fact, the sort of cynics, if you like, say, well, privacy's dead, get over it, full stop. Like, you know, there isn't privacy. And to some extent, at a strictly technological level in the surveillance society, there's some truth to that. But most people don't want to totally give up on that, so there's an interesting challenge for law to say, well, to wh what kind of things can we put in place now to actually try to protect privacy? And I, one way, I think, to think about that is even reconceptualizing what we mean. It's not so much a property interest as we traditionally would have kind of looked at it, but maybe more of a human right that privacy in some ways is a kind of human right in the modern world that we live, although not, not in most human rights acts, but that's all right. So anyway, that's part of it. Speaking of human rights, another response which is a little less adversarial as far as legal responses to cyberbullying is referring to human rights commissions for investigation, restorative approaches, mediation, a tribunal if you go that far. And in those, one of the places that has done a lot with that is Australia that there are a lot of cyberbullying and bullying cases are handled through human rights commissions because often, although not always, the victims of cyberbullying are vulnerable groups. They're gay, they're disabled, they're black, they're aboriginal, whatever it might be. Not always. Anybody can be bullied or cyberbullied, but some of them are. And so that's another option that's a useful one. Range of things they can do, as I mentioned. Also very important is the cost and accessibility that as you all know, going through courts and going all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada is an expensive proposition, whereas going to a human rights commission and filing a complaint is a much more accessible process where in many cases you don't really even have to hire a lawyer and a lot of the work is done for you as the complainant. So that's uh, another thing. Harassment, a particularly useful section for dealing with these kind of things. Human, human rights code harassment and cyberbullying based on disability or based on gender pretty neatly fits that. So the one case, uh, North Vancouver and Gibran did uh, already from the BC Court of Appeal has held schools liable for not adequately preventing bullying and well, more bullying in that case, years of bullying of uh, Mr. Gibran allegedly on the, well, on the basis of perceived sexual orientation. And nice little 
lawyers playing with words, because it was perceived, and Mr. Gibran said, but I'm not gay. So the answer at the first level is, well, you don't come within the human rights code then. Right? So it says you can't discriminate based on sexual orientation. It doesn't say anything about perceived sexual orientation, so you lose. The, the Court of Appeal disagreed with that and said no. Even some, some places like Nova Scotia specifically say actual or perceived, but even if they don't, that it's discrimination to be treated adversely because of a perceived categorization. And so they found them against them. And very significant damages against the school board because they didn't adequately prevent and educate about bullying. They did all the usual stuff. They suspended, they kicked them out every time they did it, but they kept doing it. And one of the things the court said is, well, it obviously didn't work, right? Every time, every year, this kid would get bullied. Every year, you would suspend the people who do it and the new people all the time, and things never changed. What you should be doing is something more systemic, like educating and preventing. So anyway, interesting uh, BC Court of Appeal case. One of our recommendations uh, was to, along those lines, to suggest a protocol between the Department of Education and Human Rights Commissions about passing along cases that might be appropriate for that. Restorative approaches is another very uh, in vogue kind of thing. Uh, alternative dispute resolution, looking more at integrating people back into the community, focused not just on the victim, but also the perpetrator, the bystanders, everybody. It's a, in part, a throwback to kind of Aboriginal circle sentencing and these kind of things. Everything new is old and vice versa. But questions sometimes about, uh, it's a very useful thing, but how far does that go? Is that appropriate if it's sexualized cyberbullying and you have victims sort of facing uh, uh, perpetrators and so on, all those kind of questions. I'll just flip through. Just about every province now has cyberbullying uh, provisions and bullying provisions in the Education Act, most of them fairly recent. Ontario, Nova Scotia, and Quebec probably the most at the moment, but others are quickly uh, catching up. And I'll, I'll just go through these, but uh, you can take that away if you're interested or from one of these other provinces that just about everybody has these. Concluding thoughts. So having tried to be balanced, as you no doubt recall, I'm always balanced in my presentations, right? So having had a picture of both Peter McKay and Prime Minister Harper earlier, I'll take a little shot at them now because that's kind of fair, right? So uh, the, one of the issues that we looked at and anybody looks at in bullying and cyberbullying is role models. And while in school is obvious a lot of focus on young people and their activities, uh, but where do they get the role models? And often, it's, in most cases, it's adults. And while on the one hand, you have uh, Prime Minister Harper and his wife and others saying, well, we, this is terrible, we got to do something about it. On the other hand, and you can debate this, we have attack ads, and this is not unique to any particular party, it's happening provincially as well, attack ads against particular uh, people. Now, maybe if you enter the world of politics, you consent to a certain amount of abuse and bullying and cyberbullying. I don't know. There's all those debates, but this was sort of a rather clever cartoon by our other Herald uh, cartoonist, the adder, sort of saying, well, you know, Role models are critical, but meanwhile, the early attack ads against Justin Trudeau being put out by the same people that's saying bullying is a problem. So, uh, Very significant, I think, and again, unfortunate that the tragedy of her death is what did it, but the main catalyst, I mean, like to think partly of the task force, but at least as important in terms of immediate action was the high-profile suicide death of Fratea Parsons and the Cyber Safety Act, the, the Cyber Scan Unit, uh, changes to the, the jurisdiction of the education. A lot happened after the Retea Parsons case in a short time. And at the moment, Nova Scotia is kind of, uh, for better or for worse, the kind of lead experimenter on these things. And other provinces are looking to things like that to see how it works out. But certainly, she was the key and leading justice on that. So, when the report first came out, the Minister of Education, Ramona Janex, uh, didn't entirely uh, embrace all off or some of the recommendations. So the cartoonist thought she might be bullying me. I don't know if she was or not. But in any event, that, uh, that was that, that one. And the website, uh, for those who want to uh, look at any more of detail on this or pass it along, is this is the right one. 
the actual uh, one in the piece that you have is not correct. So if you're keen about that, it is antibullying.novascotia.ca. I think the one on the actual handout has cyberbullyingnovascotia.ca. If you Google, that'll get you there as well. But this will get you directly there. And it's not just the task force report, but a whole number of things. So in the very few moments that we have left, any questions or comments or whatever? Yes? I'm just curious, when you were doing the whole study, did you um, look into uh, was bullying, has bullying always been a problem? Like there's these suicides that happen now, but it's, it's more obvious now that it's because of bullying, because it's recorded in, in uh, social media, but did, did suicides happen before because of bullying, and where do we know when we look into traditional bullying? Really good question. We did look a little bit, but the time was fairly short, so we didn't come up with any answers in that. But without doubt, bullying has been around forever and to some extent will likely be around forever. I mean, we're not, but the aim of the task force was not to eliminate bullying and cyberbullying, but to reduce it. And, uh, but I think two things. One, we record it more, but probably even more significant, the impact because of social media and technology is so much greater. And we had people presenting to the task force saying, well, it used to be that at least you had your home as a sanctuary. You know, bullying occurred on the school ground, but you went home and closed your door and had a relatively safe home, or some did. Not anymore. Bullying is 24-7. It's on the internet. And the other, again, age difference on issues of social media, another answer, people say, well, that's easy. Just shut off the, the computer. That's, just shut off the computer, nothing to that. Well. You might as well, in fact, if you gave a young person a choice, you can either stop breathing or get completely disconnected from the internet. My guess is they'd stop breathing, right? Like, I mean, that is life. Life is lived online, social media. And in fact, another interesting study along kind of a bit of a tangent, but we did an, uh, an analysis of what were the major reasons that young people who were victim of bullying and cyberbullying didn't tell an adult. And you would think, or most would think, well, because it'll get worse. Don't tell anybody because they'll make it worse. Number two reason. Number one reason, my parents will cut off the internet. That was the number one reason that they didn't tell somebody that they were being bullied or cyberbullied because they might be disconnected from the lifeline of social media. So I think the main answer to your question, I think social media cyberbullying has so much more impact. It's still bullying, but so much more impact, so much more pervasive that I think there's more. But we are also paying more attention to it, which is a good thing. There's much more consciousness now everywhere about issues of bullying and cyberbullying. Any other questions, comments, answers, solutions? Everybody's ready to go get a reception and dinner and all that stuff, which is fine. All right, if there's no questions, thank you very much for attending. If anybody wants the slides, they're there. And it was fun. Thanks a lot.